that we set up. Pfizer has committed 20 million vaccine doses, commencing with deliveries at the end of the first quarter. We are continuing our engagement with all vaccine manufacturers to ensure that we secure sufficient quantities of vaccines that are suitable for our conditions in terms of the, var the variant that we have here. The health and safety of our people remains our paramount concern. All medication imported in South Africa are monitored, they are evaluated, they are investigated and inspected and registered by the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority. We will continue to use the science-driven approach that has served us so well since the earliest days of the pandemic. The success of the vaccination program will rely on active collaboration between all sectors of society. We are greatly encouraged by the active involvement of business, labor, health industry players, as well as medical aid schemes, and in particular, in preparing for the mass vaccination drive that they've been involved in. As we have overcome before, we will overcome this challenge once again, and we will rise. But it is not just this disease that we must defeat. We must overcome poverty, hunger, joblessness, and the inequality in our country. We must overcome a legacy of exclusion and dispossession that continues to impoverish our people and which this pandemic has severely worsened. When I delivered the State of the Nation address in this House last year, none of us could have imagined how within a matter of weeks our country and our world would have changed so dramatically. Our plans had to be adapted in response to a global emergency. The budgets that we had crafted had to be reprioritized and many programs that we had as government in our various departments, including in our provinces and our local government structures, had to be deferred. Over the past year, South Africa has experienced a sharp decline in growth and a significant increase in the unemployment. Poverty is on the rise, inequality is deepening. In the third quarter of 2020, our economy was 6% smaller than it was in the last quarter of 2019. There were 1.7 million fewer people employed in the third quarter of 2020 than there were in the first quarter before the pandemic struck. Our unemployment rate now stands at a staggering 30.8%. As a result of the relief measures that we implemented and the phased reopening of the economy, we expect to see a strong recovery in employment by the end of the year. As we work to contain the spread of the virus, we also had to take extraordinary measures to support ordinary South Africans. We also had to assist businesses, businesses that were in distress and protect people's livelihoods. The social and economic relief package that we introduced in April of last year is by any accounts the largest intervention of its kind in the history of our country. It identified measures worth a total of 500 billion, or about 10% of our GDP, to provide cash directly to the poorest households, to provide wage support to workers, 
and to provide various forms of relief to struggling businesses. This had never been done in the history of our country. A total of 18 million people, or close to one third of our population, received additional grant payments through these relief measures. It is estimated that this grant lifted more than five million people above the food poverty line, helping to alleviate hunger in a moment of great distress and crisis. To date, more than 57 billion in wage support has been paid to over 4.5 million workers through the special UIF tariff scheme. More than 1.3 billion has been provided in support, mainly for small and medium enterprises. In addition, over 70 billion rand in tax relief was extended to businesses in distress. Around 18 billion rand in loans have been approved for 13,000 businesses through the loan guarantee scheme that we put together. To fellow South Africans, it is nearly four months since I stood here before the joint sitting of this parliament to present to the nation the economic reconstruction and recovery plan. This evening, we stand here not to make promises, but to report on the progress in the implementation of the recovery plan and also the priority actions that we need to take to restore growth and to create jobs. Since the launch of the plan, we have focused on four priority interventions. A massive rollout of infrastructure throughout the country, a massive increase in local production, an employment stimulus to create jobs and support livelihoods, and the rapid expansion of our energy generation capacity. We announced that we would be embarking on a massive rollout of infrastructure throughout the country. We knew that to achieve this objective, we would need to steadily rebuild the technical skills within government to prepare and to manage large infrastructure projects. These were skills that had been lost over time. We have now developed an infrastructure investment program or project pipeline that is worth 340 billion rand in network industries such as energy, water, transport, as well as telecommunications. Construction has already started and progress is being made on a number of these projects. Since the announcement of the reconstruction and recovery plan, we have launched two major human settlement projects that will provide homes to almost 68,000 households here in, in Gauteng. Well, not here in Gauteng, in Gauteng in the north. <laughs> Similar human settlement projects are planned all over the country in a number of other provinces. Two years ago, I spoke about the dream of building new cities that will enable us to make a break, a decisive break with apartheid special development. Many people laughed. Many scoffed the idea of new post-apartheid cities are being conceptualized in a number of places in our country, in a number of provinces. The Lanseria Smart City, the first new city to be built in a democratic South Africa, is now a reality in the making. The draft master plan for this smart city, which will become home to between 350,000 to half a million people within the next decade was completed in November 2020 
and is now out for public comment. This is reality. It is happening as we speak. And we now have, we now have a number of local government structures cooperating to build this city. Progress is being made on several major water infrastructure projects. These include phase two of the Mokolo and Crocodile River project and the Mkomazi water project as well. The infrastructure investment plan identifies roads and projects worth 19 billion rand covering the spine of the South African road network. Work is underway to finalize project finance and structuring for these projects. Resources have been committed for the, from the fiscus to support the construction and rehabilitation of the major N1, N2, and N3 highways. These infrastructure projects will lead to the revival of our construction industry and the creation of much needed jobs. The 100 billion infrastructure fund is now in full operation. This fund will blend resources from the fiscus and financing from the private sector and development institutions. Its approved project pipeline for 2021 is varied and includes projects such as student housing infrastructure, which aims to provide 300,000 student beds. Another approved project is SA Connect, a program to roll out broadband to schools, hospitals, police stations, and other government facilities. The second priority intervention of the recovery plan is to support the massive increase in local production and to make South African exports globally competitive. This will encourage greater investment by the private sector in productive activity. And key to this plan is the renewed commitment from government, business, and organized labor to buy locally made products. And we've always been talking about localization and saying we encourage South Africans to buy local to ensure that even what you wear, like the suit I'm wearing tonight, is locally made by South African workers. This commitment should lead to increased local production, which will lead to the revival of our manufacturing industry, which will lead to the employment of more and more of our people. It, if many of us men buy the suits that are made locally, more workers will be employed in the factories that make this suit. All social partners who participated in the development of the Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Plan as part of our social compact have agreed to work together to reduce our reliance on imports by 20% over the next five years. They have identified 42 products ranging from edible oils to furniture to fruit concentrates to personal protective equipment, steel products, and green economy inputs that can be sourced locally because if we focus our mind on buying local, entrepreneurs will start making them. And entrepreneurs will start exporting them and competing with the rest of the world but it should start here at home with us. If we achieve our target, we will significantly expand our productive economy, potentially returning more than 200 billion rand to the country's annual output. Last year, we undertook to create a larger market for small business and designate 1,000 locally produced products that must be procured from small, medium, 
enterprises. As the COVID-19 pandemic forced the closure of global value chains, we have been able to speed up the initiative as the local supply chains become more open for locally manufactured products. To this end, Cabinet approved the Small Medium Enterprise Focused Localization Policy Framework, which identified 1,000 products. Furthermore, the Department of Small Business Development and Trade and Industry and Competition are supporting small and medium enterprises to access larger domestic and international markets. I've been very impressed with the work that these two departments have been doing. These efforts are supported by robust manufacturing support programs. In the State of the Nation address last year, I said that our vision for industrialization is underpinned by sector master plans to rejuvenate and grow key industries. Four master plans that have been completed and signed to date, which are part of the social compact between labor, business, and government and communities have already had an impact in their respective industries. Through the implementation of the poultry master plan, and remember our poultry industry was under a lot of stress. What the poultry industry needed was to have a master plan, which would have, should have been arrived at, and it did, it did happen, on a compact basis. Now we're seeing progress in that industry. The industry has now invested 800 million rand to upgrade production. South Africa now produces an additional 1 million chickens every week. Now that is great progress. The Sugar Master Plan was signed during the lockdown with a commitment from large users of sugar to procure at least 80% of their sugar needs from local growers. Now, through the implementation of the plan last year, we saw a rise in local production and a decline in imported sugar, creating stability for an industry which employs well over 85,000 workers. Support for black small-scale farmers is being stepped up with a large beverage producer committing to expand their procurement sharply and focusing on the small medium enterprise producers. Now, since the signing of the clothing, textile, footwear, and leather master plan in November in 2019, the industry has invested more than half a billion rand to expand local manufacturing facilities, including small medium enterprises. We have worked closely with the auto sector to help it weather the pandemic. By the end of the year, the sector had recovered around 70% of its normal annual production in difficult circumstances. Last week, the Ford Motor Company announced a 16 billion rand investment to expand their manufacturing facility in Swani for the next generation Ford Ranger Bucky, which they will export around the world to well over 150 countries. Now, this investment will support the growth of around 12 and more small medium enterprises in the automotive component manufacturing, an area in which many black-owned small businesses have never really entered. Now, through this initiative and this investment, we are going to see a number of small-medium enterprises, largely in the Pretoria area, Mamelodi, Easterus, and places like that, coming to the fore and becoming active and being productive. Nearly half of the procurement spend on construction of the bulk earthworks 
and top structure of the Tswane Special Economic Zone. During this phase, it's expected to be allocated to small medium enterprises, and I was told that it would be more some 200 medium enterprises, and the value could well be something like 1.7 billion rand in procurement opportunities. Toyota has invested in the KwaZulu Natal facility to start production of the first generation hybrid electric vehicles to come off a South African assembly line. Now, this follows investment announcements by Nissan, Mercedes-Benz, and Isuzu in expanded production facilities, all of which cement South Africa's position as a global player in auto manufacturing and the biggest on the African continent. This year, our focus will be on getting the industry back to full production, implementing the Black Industrialist Fund and working on a new platform for expanded auto trade with the rest of the continent. Now, a number of countries on our continent are already setting up their own auto manufacturing plants. But they are going to be relying on South Africa to supply them with various components and a whole lot of other products that, have, that go into building cars. Now, this will be the part of our concerted effort to boost our manufacturing sector, which has been going down. This year, we will begin to harness the opportunities presented by the African Continental Free Trade Area, which came into operation on the 1st of January following the adoption of the Johannesburg Declaration by the African Union. The AFC FTA provides a platform for South African businesses to expand into markets across the continent and for South Africa to position herself as a gateway to the continent, to address the deep inequalities in our society, we must accelerate the implementation of broad-based black economic empowerment policies on ownership, on control, and management of our economy. That is a policy that must be implemented, and there is no reversal on that policy whatsoever. <laughs> Last year, government agreed to landmark deals with companies that will advance black economic empowerment by transferring ownership to their workers. In November last year, we held our third South African Investment Conference to review the implementation of previous commitments and to generate new investment into our economy. Even under the difficult economic circumstances, the Investment Conference managed to raise 108 billion rand in additional investment commitments from a number of investors, together with investment commitment confirmed from the two previous investment conferences. We have now received 773 billion in investment commitments towards our five-year target of 1.2 trillion rand. This is phenomenally successful. Firms have reported that some 183 billion of these investments has already flowed into projects that benefit the South African economy. This shows that our country is still an attractive investment destination for both local and offshore companies. We have worked to facilitate investment by increasing the ease of doing business, including by making it easier to start a business. This is one area that had slipped backwards, and we've been doing quite a lot of work to ensure that the ease of doing business is boosted 
so that investors, business people can easily come to our country, set up companies, and start business. In the past year, more than 125,000 new companies have been registered through the BIS portal platform, completing their registration in just a matter of hours from the comfort of their homes or their offices. And now it happens just like that in a flash. We are making it easier for business to do business. Our third priority intervention is an employment stimulus to create jobs and to support livelihoods. The largest number of jobs obviously will be created by the private sector in a number of industries as the economy recovers. So the private sector remains the primary and the biggest creator of jobs. And it is for this reason that we've embarked on massive reforms so that the private sector can continue investing in our country. We continue to work in a social compact with the private sector to create more conducive environments for them to be able to create jobs. Our compact with the private sector is underpinned by a clear commitment to grow our economy and to create jobs. However, the public sector also has a responsibility to stimulate job creation, both through its policies and through direct job creation opportunities. The Presidential Employment Stimulus is one of the most significant expansions of public and social employment in South Africa's history. By the end of January 2021, over 430,000 opportunities have already been supported through the stimulus. Now, a further 180,000 opportunities are currently in the recruitment process. These opportunities are in areas like education, the arts, film, and so forth, and culture, global business services, early childhood development, and small-scale and subsistence farming. It also involves environmental programs, such as the clearing of alien trees, the wetland rehabilitation, fire protection and prevention, as well as cleaning and greening across our municipalities. These programs are about real lives and real livelihoods. Nearly half a million people are now receiving an income, developing new skills, and contributing to their community and to the country's economy. This is no small feat. It means something is being done. We will continue to support employment for as long as it is necessary while the labor market recovers even as we work to promote stronger and more resilient growth in the private sector. So we see a symbiotic relationship between the public sector and the private sector. The private sector will create the greatest bulk of jobs. But at the same time, at the public sector level, it is essential that yes, we also focus on what happens in our schools, what happens on the social in, uh, economy side, and all these matters are being attended to. In the State of the Nation address last year, in response to the huge challenge our country faces with regard to youth unemployment, I announced that the National Youth Development Agency and the Department of Small Business Development would provide grant funding and business support to 1,000 young entrepreneurs within 100 days. While the program had to be put on hold due to the coronavirus, it nevertheless managed to reach its target of 1,000 youth businesses 
by International Youth Day on the 12th of August 2020. And we applaud the young people of our country who are running this program. This provides a firm foundation for our efforts to support 15,000 startups by 2024. Last year, we said we would establish a national pathway management network to provide support and opportunities to young people across the country. I want to encourage every young South African to join the more than 1.2 million people who are already in the network and take their next steps to a better future. On the many hardships, of the many hardships our people had to experience last year, schooling disruption plays a huge burden on learners, on teachers, and also on families. Despite this, they persevered. It is our priority for this year to regain lost time and improve educational outcomes from the early years through to high school and post-school education and training. The fourth priority that I'd like to talk about of the recovery plan is, the rapidly, is to rapidly expand energy generation capacity in our country. Now, restoring ESCOM to operational and financial health and accelerating its reconstruction process is central to the work that we have to do. ESCOM has been restructured into three separate entities for generation, transmission, and distribution. This will lay the foundation for an efficient, modern, and a competitive energy system in South Africa. ESCOM is making substantial progress with its intensive maintenance and operational excellence programs to improve the reliability of its cold fleet. We are working closely with ESCOM on proposal to improve its financial position, to manage its debt, and reduce its dependence on the fiscus. This requires a review of the tariff path to ensure that it reflects all the reasonable costs and measures to resolve the problem of municipal debt as well. In December 2020, government and its social partners signed the historic ESCOM Social Compact, which outlines the necessary actions we must take collectively and as individual constituencies to meet the country's energy needs now and into the future. Now, over the last year, we have taken action to urgently and substantially increase generation capacity in addition to what ESCOM generates. The Department of Mineral Resources and Energy will soon be announcing the successful bids for 2,000 megawatts of emergency power that our country needs. The necessary regulations have been amended and the requirements clarified for municipalities to buy power from independent power producers. Systems are being put in place to support qualifying municipalities. Government will soon be initiating the procurement of an additional 11,800 megawatts of power from renewable energy, natural gas, battery storage, and coal in line with the Integrated Resource Plan of 2019. Despite this work, ESCOM estimates that without additional capacity, there will be an electricity supply shortfall of between 4,000 and 6,000 megawatts over the next five years as our old coal-fired power stations reach the end of their life. As part of the measures to address this shortfall, we will, in the coming weeks, issue a request for proposals for 2,600 megawatts from wind and solar energy as part of bid window five. This will be followed by another bid window in August of 2021. 
Now, recent analysis suggests that easing licensing requirements for new embedded generation projects could unlock up to 5,000 megawatts of additional capacity and also help to ease the impact of load shedding. We will therefore amend Schedule 2 of the Electricity Regulation Act within the next three months to increase the licensing threshold for embedded generation. This will include consultation amongst key role players on the level at which the new threshold should be set and the finalization of the necessary enabling frameworks. ESCOM has already started work to expedite its commercial and technical processes to allow this additional capacity onto the grid within undue delays. There have been complaints that the time that they take to process these has been far too long. It's now been agreed that they are going to do it much quicker. Now, as we mobilize all the resources at our disposal to support economic recovery, we cannot lose sight of the threat that climate change poses to our environmental health, socioeconomic development, and economic growth. We are therefore working to fulfill our commitments under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement, which include the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. ESCOM, our largest greenhouse gas emitter, has committed in principle to net zero emission by 2050 and to increase its renewable capacity. So ESCOM will be looking to partner with investors to repurpose and to repower part of its coal fleet. This will be done in a way that will stimulate investment, that will also stimulate local economic activity as well as local manufacturing as part of the just transition that will need to take care of the people who work in those power stations, the people who work in the towns where power stations reside. Our work on climate change will be guided by the Presidential Coordinating Commission on Climate Change, which is meeting for the first time uh, this month. The Commission will work on a plan for a just transition to a low carbon economy and climate resilient society. We will not achieve higher rates of growth and employment if we do not implement structural economic reforms. These reforms are necessary to reduce costs and barriers to entry into our economy. They are necessary also to increase competition, to stimulate new investment. They are also necessary to create space for new entrants into the market. This work is being driven through Operation Vulindela which involves a team of National Treasury and the President's Office. Operation Polinkiela is focusing on reforms in the electricity, water, telecommunications, and transport sectors, as well as reforms to our visa and immigration regime. The completion of digital migration is vital to our ability to effectively harness the enormous opportunities that are presented by technological change that is just going on around the world. After many delays, we will begin the phased switch off of our analog TV transmitters from next month. It is anticipated that this process, which will be done province by province, will be completed by the end of March in 2022. The process for the licensing of high-speed spectrum is at an advanced stage. We hope that the ongoing litigation amongst interested parties on the licensing matter will provide 
certainty and will not unduly delay the spectrum auction process that we have decided on. In the water sector, we are working through Operation Volindela to ensure that water licenses are finalized within the revised time frame of 90 days and to revive the green drop and blue drop programs to strengthen water quality monitoring in our country. Now, we will finalize and implement the revised raw water pricing strategy and accelerate the establishment of a National Water Resource Infrastructure Agency. I firmly believe that if we really do want to resolve our water challenges, we need an agency that will be focused just on ensuring that water is treated with the importance and the sensitivity that it requires. Many of our people are struggling. They cry out for water on an ongoing basis. Now, establishing a water agency will be one of the better ways to resolve these challenges so that the agency can have a globular look at the water needs of the country and address those challenges. Our ability to compete in global markets depends on the efficiency of our ports and rail network. We are repositioning Durban as the hub port for the Southern Hemisphere and developing Moha as the container terminal of choice. The rail corridor from Gauteng is being extended to enable the export of vehicles through Port Elizabeth. These are crucial steps to move freight from road to rail and increase the competitiveness of the rail system in our country. Now, work is underway with the relevant departments to reform our visa immigration regime to attract skills and to grow the tourism sector. As international travel starts to recover in the wake of COVID-19, we will undertake a full rollout of e-visas to visitors from China, India, Nigeria, Kenya, and 10 other countries in the world. Now, the revised list of critical skills will be published for public comment by the Department of Home Affairs within one week to ensure that the final version reflects the skills that are needed by our economy. This, too, has taken far too long to be done, but it is now going to be done. The momentum that Operation Volindela has already built and the support that it has received across government shows that we are serious about reform. We will continue to work relentlessly and without pause to create a more modern, a more efficient and competitive economy that is more open to all South Africans. Now, to support our reform process, the Presidential State-Owned Enterprise Council has outlined a clear set of reforms that will enable these vital public companies to fulfill their mandate for growth and development. Overarching legislation for state-owned enterprises will be tabled in Cabinet this financial year and Parliament uh, in the next financial year. A centralized SOE model is being implemented this financial year, which will ensure a standardized governance, financial management, and operational performance framework for all our SOEs. The mandates of all SOEs are being re-evaluated to ensure that they are responsive to the country's needs and the implementation of the National Development Plan. In the midst of the economic damage caused by COVID-19, South Africa's agricultural sector has performed remarkably well. In 2020, we became the world's second largest exporter of citrus, with strong export growth in wine, in maize, in nuts, in deciduous fruit, and in sugarcane. 
Now, the favorable weather conditions in 2020 and the beginning of the 2021 mean that agriculture is likely to grow in the near term. This provides an opportunity for further public-private partnerships in the agricultural sector to promote transformation and to ensure sustainable growth. It is an, an opportunity to accelerate land redistribution through a variety of instruments, such as land restitution, expropriation of land in order to boost agricultural output. To date, government has redistributed over 5 million hectares of land, totaling around 5,500 farms for, to more than 300,000 beneficiaries. This is in addition to the land restitution process, which has benefited over 2 million land claimants and resulted in the transfer of 2.7 million hectares of land. We are also pursuing programs to assist smallholder and emerging farmers with market access to develop skills across the entire agricultural value chain and to increase the number of commercial black farmers as well. During the course of the next financial year, we will establish a land and agrarian reform agency to fast track land reform. The public service is at the coalface of government and lack of professionalism does not just impact service delivery, it also dents public confidence. Now advancing honesty, ethics and integrity in the public service is critical if we are to build a capable state. Now, through the National School of Government, we continue to roll out courses and training programs to government officials, from entry level to senior management and to the executive. In October last year, I signed off on ministerial performance agreements with all ministers which have now been published online. This will enhance accountability and focus performance by members of the executive. We remain on course to build a capable and professional civil service that delivers on its mandate and is accountable to the people of South Africa. We are proceeding with our efforts to strengthen local government and to strengthen local government infrastructure and accelerate service delivery through the district development model. The model brings all stake uh, spheres of government to focus on key priorities and implementation of critical high impact projects. Working with both public and private sector partners, government is implementing a range of measures to support municipalities to address inadequate and inconsistent service delivery in areas such as water provision, infrastructure build, maintenance. We are also focusing on the appointment of properly qualified officials at local level to ensure effective management and provision of services. In some municipalities, we have often found that less than well-qualified people have been appointed and all they ever do is to mess up. Now, we are saying the days of messing up are now over. We want professional people to run our local government. As we prepare for local government elections, which are due to take place this year, we will need to adjust to the conditions forced upon us by COVID-19 so that we can ensure that the people of this country can determine who represents them at the crucial level of government. So fellow South Africans, 
corruption is one of the greatest impediments to the country's growth and development. The revelations from the Zondo Commission of Inquiry lay bare the extent of state capture and related corruption. Now, testimony of the Commission has shown how the criminal justice system was compromised and weakened. It is therefore vital that we sustain the momentum of rebuilding that we have begun through the past three years. There has been great progress in turning around law enforcement bodies. Critical leadership positions have been filled with capable, experienced, and trustworthy professionals. There is improved cooperation and sharing of resources between the respective law enforcement agencies, enabling more integrated approach to investigations and prosecutions. We have started implementation of the National Anti-Corruption Strategy, which lays the basis for a comprehensive and integrated society-wide response to, to corruption. We will shortly be appointing the members of the National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council, which is a multi-sectoral body that will oversee initial implementation of the strategy and the establishment of an independent statutory and anti-corruption body that will report to this parliament. To this parliament. Not not to the executive, but to this parliament, to all of you sitting here, it will report. When reports started to surface last year about possible fraud and corruption in the procurement of COVID-related goods and services, we acted with speed and decisively to put a stop to these practices, to investigate all allegations, to act against those responsible. We established the Fusion Center, which brings together key law enforcement agencies to share information and resources. Now, this Fusion Center has brought many cases to trial and preserved or recovered millions of rands in public funds. The Special Investigating Unit has authorized, was authorized to investigate allegations of unlawful conduct with respect to COVID procurement by all state bodies during the national state of disaster. As it reported last week, the SIU has finalized investigations into 164 contracts with a total value of 3.5 billion rand. In a significant advance to transparency and accountability, the political party funding act will come into operation on the 1st of April of this year. Yeah? Well, you don't seem to be very excited about this. It's now going to happen. This will regulate public and private funding of political parties. Among other things, it requires the disclosure of donations to parties and establishes two funds that will enable represented political parties to undertake their programs. Crime and violence continues to undermine people's sense of safety and security. Tackling crime is central to the success of our recovery. Crimes like cable theft, railway infrastructure vandalizing, land invasion, construction sites disruptions, and attacks on trucks hamper economic activity and discourages investment. We are taking steps and will continue to take steps to stop these crimes and to deal with those responsible in terms of the law. Task teams have been set up in a number of provinces to deal with extortion and violence on sites of economic activity. We are also fast-tracking the implementation and capacitation 
of the Border Management Agency to curb illegal immigration and cross-border crime. That is now going to happen. Ending gender-based violence is imperative if we lay claim to being a society that is rooted in equality and non-sexism. When I launched the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence and Femicide in April last year, I made a promise to the women and children of our country that we were going to strengthen the criminal justice system to prevent them being traumatized again and to ensure okay. that perpetrators okay. face justice. Now, to give effect to this, three key pieces of legislation were introduced in Parliament last year to make the criminal justice system much more effective in combating gender-based violence. To ensure that perpetrators are brought to book, we are making progress in reducing the backlog of gender-based violence cases. We continue to provide care and support to survivors of gender-based violence. In the State of the Nation address last year, I said that we would prioritize the economic empowerment of women. Last year, Cabinet approved a policy that 40% of public procurement should go to women-owned businesses and entities. And our several departments in government have started implementing this policy and are making a great deal of progress. Last week, we also launched a groundbreaking private sector-led GBVF response fund. Several South African companies and global philanthropies made pledges to the value of 128 million rand to assist in the fight against gender-based violence. Now, that was unprecedented. Over the next three years, Government will allocate approximately 12 billion rand to implement the various components of the National Strategic Plan. Gender-based violence will only end when everyone takes responsibility for doing so in their homes, in their communities, in their workplaces, and in their places of worship, and in our centers of learning, schools, universities, and colleges. Equally, we need to give attention to issues affecting children, including improving school readiness, ECD planning, and funding protection against preventable diseases, policy reform around child welfare and reducing welfare violence rather against children. In the year ahead, we are also going to forge ahead with efforts to provide greater opportunities to persons with disabilities to participate in the economy and in society in general. As we rebuild our economy in the midst of this pandemic, it is necessary that we continue within our means to provide support to those businesses and individuals that continue to be most affected. Businesses in several sectors are still struggling and many families continue to suffer as the job market slowly recovers. Over the last few months, we have had ongoing discussions with our social partners in business, in labor, and community-based organization on the proposed extension of some of the social and economic support measures. We have therefore decided to extend the period for the special COVID-19 grant of 350 by a further three months. This has proven to be an effective and efficient short-term measure to reduce the immediate impact on the livelihoods of uh, poor South Africans who are out of work. We've also decided to extend the COVID-19 tariffs benefit until the 15th of March 2021, only for those sectors that have not been able to open or to operate. 
The conditions for this extension and the sectors to be included will be announced after consultation with the social partners at NETLEC. The National Treasury will work with its partners and stakeholders on improvements that we believe now need to take place to the loan guarantee scheme that we inaugurated when we announced the 500 billion rand uh, distress relief package. Now, this is better addressed uh, through the discussions that will be had, but we also wanted to address the realities of small medium enterprises and other businesses as they strive to recover. So that scheme needs to be recrafted, repositioned, and the Minister of uh, Finance will deal with the matter. Now, we will work with our social partners to ensure that these and other interventions provide the relief to those who need it most. Now, fellow South Africans, just as a harsh fire gives new life to our country's fame boss. This crisis is an opportunity to build a different and a better South Africa. Rebuilding our country requires a common effort. It requires that every South African takes responsibility and plays their part. Let us work together as government, as business, as labor, as political parties, and all of society to clear away the rubble and lay a new foundation as we rebuild our country. Above all, let us return this country to the values upon which it was founded. On the day of his release 31 years ago, Madiba gave his first public address here in Cape Town, where he reminded South Africans that there were difficult days that lay ahead and that the battle was far from won. Madiba said, now is the time to intensify the struggle on all fronts. To relax our efforts now would be a mistake which generations will to come will not be able to forgive." Close quotes. In counting the great cost to our society over the past year, we may be tempted to lose faith. But we can get through this because we are a nation that never gives up. We are a nation that is never defeated. We are a nation of heroes right across the country. I am referring not to the glorious lineage of struggle icons, but to the everyday heroes that walk amongst us, who work hard every day to put food on the table of their homes, to keep the company running, and to give support, help, and care to our people. It is your resilience that will help this country recover. In addition to the many challenges that beset our people, we have heard that this, that His Majesty King Goodwill Zuelitini has not been well in recent days and he has had to be admitted to hospital. I wish to convey my wishes for speedy recovery of His Majesty King Zuelitini our thoughts and prayers are with the royal household and the Zulu nation at this difficult time that the king is going through. It is our collective wish that Isilo Samabanta Hwonke is soon restored to good health. As we prepare for the difficult path that lies ahead, we can draw strength from Maya Angelou's great poem, I Rise. And she writes, out of the hearts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling. 
I bear in the tide, leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, and I rise. Close quotes. Now, people of South Africa, it is your country that calls on you to rise. Let us march forward together to equality, to growth, to dignity, and to recovery. May God continue to bless and protect our beautiful country and also to protect her sons and daughters. I thank you. Long live President Ramaphosa, long live! Long live President hey. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank the Honorable the President. Long live the chair! Long live! Having thanked the President, uh, I also wish to indicate that uh, after I've attended the joint sitting, the arms and the usher will leave the chamber in the following order. The Speaker of the National Assembly, the Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, the President, the Acting Secretary to Parliament. Honorable Members, after the joint sitting has ended and the procession has left the chamber, there will be a candle lighting ceremony on the steps next to the main foyer outside the National Assembly chamber. The Chief Whip of the Council, as well as the Chief Whip or party representative from each political party present, is invited to take part in the ceremony. That, Honorable Members, concludes the business for the day, and the joint sitting is adjourned. <laughs>